Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week I'm with Adriana Cavita, the brilliant Mexican chef whose journey from her grandmother's street food stall to top international restaurants like Pujol and El Bulli has brought the real flavours of Mexico to London. Basically, I arrived here to open a Mexican restaurant and people always ask, ah, but do, do you have burritos? Do you have uh, guacamole? Do you have um, chimichangas, you know? And I'm like, okay, n- no. <laughs> Have a listen to the resilience of this woman. She's like a hurdler, jumping the barriers of gender, language, money, envy to open her own restaurant in London. She says that this book is for all the women of her home country and for women everywhere whose struggle can lead to such massive change in the world. But I began by asking her what that responsibility felt like. It is a really big responsibility and uh, to tell the history of food through women no? and all those women that cannot really have the opportunity to share their their lives to share their recipes to share the the issues or like everything that they've been through in their lives i mean in, when i started the book also i was like i don't know where can i start where how i want to share that but also i wanted to make it as simple and very connected to, to my roots and the heritage of Mexican food, to the earth, to the land, to the people and the community that, that we have in Mexico, no? I, it's, it's a big story. I mean, you do start literally at the <laughs> beginning. You start at, you know, it, it, in a fantasy way about how you imagine that women cooks discovered how to use corn in the many, many ways, because, of course, corn is used in absolutely every dish in, in Mexico. And you go right the way through your career through the with the with the spirit of your grandmother very much sitting on your shoulders through your extraordinary career to a deep connection with where you come from and where you are now let's start off with your grandmother first of all let's because it is really that she's the heartbeat of this book isn't she this is your first food moment as well yeah yeah i mean my grandma i think it was an amazing woman and i think uh it was the the center person in my family actually and her name was Pilar actually which means like Pilar Pilar, yeah literally and she was a really strong woman like all the memories I have about her she was cooking tamales cooking drinks or like street food she actually had this street food stall in at her house Uh, yeah this is very common in Mexico you know like Many people just open the doors in the garage and sell antojitos or tamales or quesadillas. Yeah. And because she had to take care of seven, eight childs, actually. Nine at the end, yeah, yeah. She had seven. Uh, and then she adopted two more. So she really had to work a lot to take care of them and to feed them. And that's why she... Um, open this 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 business, no? And I just remember her doing the nixtamal. The, the we I always go with her to the meal place to make the corn dough, to come back and do all these street food. To, uh, to, yeah, the yeah. molina to mill the corn. So you were really you had your hands on the actual ingredients that make the Mexican food that we know. And I'm wondering whether the women are the ones who make the street food and that the street food is the food that most of the visitors, people like Domasina Myers way back, you know, came across and who brought it back to to start her restaurants, Oaxaca, which pretty much brought Mexican food to the high street. You know, I I always think it's amazing that with, and and testament to how open Britain is as a nation, that actually we eat a lot of food that we literally can't pronounce, uh, of, of Mexican food that we literally really can't pronounce and it is because (laughs) it is so pretty but it has been translated by people like your grandmother to people like us that's an enormous journey in itself I mean how does it feel for you to see so much Mexican food around I think when when I arrived here eight years ago here in in London you have less uh, Mexican restaurants but now I think the Mexican scene of restaurants and places taquerias is growing a lot 
I think we have a really good chefs that uh, have been translating that, no, and also like you mentioned, in my in my case, that was a really big responsibility, but also because here we don't have that many Mexican ingredients like hepazote or fresh hoja santa or like a lot of fruits or vegetables, like a really nice avocado, you know. But at the same time, I felt like we in London um, was missing like more authentic uh, Mexican food. And it was a little bit sad for me, you know, like to see like people always come to the restaurant. I basically I arrived here to open a Mexican restaurant and people always ask, uh, but do, do you have burritos? Do you have uh, guacamole? Do you have um, chimichangas, you know? And I'm like, okay, no, no. <laughs> I don't. And I don't want to do it, you know? Because the purpose of bringing you, you grew up in some of the most amazing restaurants in Mexico. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got from your abuela's garage selling <laughs> street food, you know, a, a really quite impoverished background to working at some of the biggest restaurants in the world. Lalo, Pujol, and of course, El Bulli in Spain with Ferran Adria. I mean, those are quite extraordinary. You were just 17 when you went to work with with those extraordinary people. How did you get there? Well, uh, when I started to study food and start to have this culinary journey, I started to study and work at the same time because my mom couldn't afford really to pay the university and basically this university was really expensive. So I just started to choose the places where I wanted to learn and uh, I was feeling connected, for example, with one of the most traditional restaurants in Mexico City, Nikos. So I started there in the, in the bakery because it, it's funny that some of the women working there they were a little bit jealous, so they didn't want to show me like <laughs> recipes, and I was like, "Oh, why?" And then the baker talked to me, and he was like, "Oh, well, I can, I can show you, you know." And then I start uh, going there at four in the morning and uh, start to learn how to make bread. Yeah. And it was just like three months, three four months, and then after that, I choose to go to Pujol because I knew it was like one of the best restaurants, even though my some of my friends, my colleagues were like very afraid to go there because they thought it's going to be very difficult. But I don't know if it's my sign. I it is that it's just like, oh, whatever, I'm just going to go. I'm in Aries too. I know that very well. It's mission driven. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do this and I don't care. Let's see if they kick me out, they kick me out and whatever yeah, it happens, yeah. it happens. And then everything was really good and they offered me a job uh, at the end, which was great. So I ended up working for them for one year and a half. And then after that, I mean... I study and work in different places, but uh, when I finish my career, the university offer like a interchange for the graduate people, basically. And they have this connection with El Bulli. So they choose 10 people from 100, uh, like, uh, yeah, like people in the university. And we make this uh, contest. And I won one space in the kitchen. I arrived there to do this uh, work for three months. But then I spoke with the chefs because I, I was learning a lot. It was really intense. It was the first like restaurant, like proper professional restaurant that I worked with. So I was really uh, amazed. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, it, this is your second food moment, you know, the, the cochinita pibil, um, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. you, you learned to cook at El Bulli. El Bulli, Ferran Adria at that time, I mean, I met him a couple of times recently um, down in Turin, where I hang out every October with all these amazing people at Buenissima, uh, including some of the food journalists who literally have told the story of European food. And I was talking to one guy who gave up his career as a rock journalist to focus on food in the 80s because he met Ferran. Yeah. 
Oh. And what he saw in Ferran was a child at play. And that was the beginning of, of a completely different way of cooking, wasn't it? And there yeah. you are at El Bli, a, a young woman, very impressionable, having learned to work with her hands at her grandmother's side, suddenly playing with food. I mean, how exciting was it for somebody, for a young chef, to be in the presence of something? I mean, it wasn't just a chef, it was a movement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was incredible I will say it challenging <laughs> because everything worth anything is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and also because uh, by back then, I mean, it, there were not many women working in these kitchens. So also, like to show that you as a woman can do whatever the men can do in the same like fast, like concentration, like. And uh, you need to really show off, no? <laughs> I mean, by the time you were there, though, Adriano, you know, Ferran literally passed the baton on to other chefs, hadn't he? Was it still at that kind of playground, though, when you were there? He was there sometimes, most of the time during the service. Uh, Oriol was the creative chef, and I actually cooked the cochinita bibil for him. Uh, because he w he always was asking about uh, this culture or other culture, or like how do you cook, what is our chile, uh, make it for me, and he was always talking to me. But imagine Oriol talking and asking you questions when and you are cooking and trying to cook fast and tidy and clean, and I, it was like very funny. Back then I was 24. After El Bulli, I came back to Mexico, and I right again to Enrique, the chef uh, at Puyol, and because I wanted to continue doing Mexican food. I wrote to him and he told me, oh yeah, actually I'm looking for a chef that is in charge of El Taller. El Taller was like the creative area of Puyol back then. And I started to travel with him doing like book presentations. I traveled with him to California, Singapore, San Sebastian, like taking care, like working side by, by side with him. But then I decided to go to New York to do Nordic food in uh, Aska. Aska. Uh, Frederick Berzelus is called the chef. But I wanted to learn something different and actually it was interesting to do like fermentation and learn to do something totally different of what I, I was used to do. And then I came back to Mexico, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we go, we get a Michelin star there. It was it, it was a really tiny kitchen with three Swedish chefs and uh, <laughs> two Mexicans. It was very what, fun. What's, what's the spirit of your abuela doing at this time? Is she so going? Kind of, what are you doing? Oh, Fermenting well, Nordic food, what, Michelin well, stars. <laughs> I I'm sure she will be very proud of me traveling, going everywhere. I mean, I was the first person in my family to go out of Mexico. Also, I, I'm like the the one that breaks the rules. I don't know. <laughs> So fast forward, you, you were invited to, uh -huh. to, to come and open Capitan, a restaurant is in Marylebone. Uh, it is not yeah. Mexican street food. It's, uh, it's a completely different take on, on Mexico. What were you trying to do there? Uh, when I came back after New York uh, uh, to Mexico, I started to learn with different maestras cocineras or like elder women that work with food. I live eight months with uh, Juanita. She's like 64 now. And I literally work with her, cook moles from scratch, like making uh, coffee, making chocolate, make, making like very homemade food, basically from this region in Oaxaca. And then when I start to travel more and more in Mexico, I realized that I really love the smell and the taste of the charcoal. So what we do in Cavita is, or what I'm trying to do is to reflect that regional cuisines, you know, like, or at least all these extremely rooted flavors from Mexico into the menu. And I'm trying to share those flavors, you know, because at the end of the day, I think what makes a restaurant good is to share something, you know, like in this case, Mexican 
flavors, Mexican tradition, Mexican uh, recipes adapted to to where we are because it's very difficult of of course to to have like a pure no like essence, but uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, well, the tuna tostada, which is your third food moment, is <laughs> actually a, a mix of Mexican and Japanese cuisine, which you serve uh, at the restaurant. Yeah. So tell us about that. In in this recipe, in this uh, dish, I try to put what I have been learning in different um, restaurants uh, after like all these years working in the in the kitchen. And I love Japanese food, you know, like the soy, the the ginger, rice vinegar, and then I add to this vinaigrette salsa matcha, which is really uh, sauce uh, from the north of Mexico. Uh, it's a mix of dried chiles, uh, pasilla, arbol, and then I have a little bit of garlic. So I make kind of a marination with both preparations to so the tuna. And I use chutoro. I, we cut it like in sashimi style. Then I add just like uh, avocado sauce on, in the bottom. Then I put the tostada and the salsa matcha on top. It's really simple, but for me, I think it's... It's really tasty, really beautiful. And, and pulls and, from that lovely Japanese tradition that, that is beautiful as well, very pretty yeah. and dainty, and, and you eat with... Delicate. Delicate, with you, and you eat with your eyes. You use flowers, uh, you use colour. Um, very, very yeah. beautiful. I think that the main thing about the book is the trip around the country. It's about you coming back, having been away mm-hmm. for a long time. Very often I hear this story that it takes going away to really kind of come back to who you are and to find the center of yourself and that takes time as well you know when we're so young we're we're so curious but that we're looking out all the time but you know as you get a bit older you start assessing and understanding who who you are and that's what it feels to me that this book is really all about and let's talk about your your fourth food moment the the markets in mexico and the street food um and particularly the pumpkin flower quesadilla which we'll get to in a minute (laughs) but Take me back to what happened when you had to reapply for your visa. And this gave you an opportunity when you were locked away in Mexico, away from (laughs) Cavite, your restaurant and your investors and your business and your customers and everything. You were stuck in Mexico. It was really, really difficult, actually. It was very tough because you need to really trust the people that is running your business and your baby and, you know, like, and also like in in the economic side, you know, like you don't know exactly how it's going to go, like it's the, the first eight months and then, but on the, on the other hand, I feel very grateful because I managed to be with my family again for longer period of time and really connect with them, you know, like that I was missing a lot, yeah. that connection. Um, I have eight years living here. So every time I come back to Mexico, it's just like one month uh, max, but uh, it's not time for travel and go with family and yeah. uh, uncles. I mean, cousins, you know, yeah. <laughs> Mexican families are very big. So this time I think I had that opportunity really and uh, come back again to, to my roots to travel again to different regions that I love. Um, And one of the things that I love the most in Mexico is the markets, because there you can see like to open a book when you go into the market and see the spices from India or like uh, all the citrus, you know, from from China or like and then the connection with with all the people selling, I don't know, from barbacoa to drinks barbecue to... mean it meaning cooking on fire and we've talked about that a lot actually it's where the word barbecue comes from actually you know you were suffering almost from a nervous breakdown because of this um enforced uh stay in mexico you know back at home Cavito, your restaurant was still operating you didn't know when you were going to be able to come back to london because of the visa situation yet you took the opportunity yeah. to go traveling, to really get deeply into your homeland and to really connect with it and write the book. I mean, this book is yeah. the result of that moment. I think that's a wonderful way of turning something incredibly stressful into something utterly beautiful and deeply grounding. Yeah, I mean, I 
I, I think I I tend to be a positive person. To actually, live in Mexico because Mexico can be very rough and tough. You know, like yeah. we as a, a culture, we are like that. You know, there are yeah. really tough moments, but then let's see the positive of of everything and try to to take advantage of that. And and then is what when I really focus in the book, I was just trying to do my best from far away. All the people that work with me and help me, I mean, it was incredible to get to de- know them better, you know, like also my business partner just saying like, don't worry about it. We are here. We support you. Like the connection with people, you know, like the persons that are holding the space for you to really make yeah. this happen. I mean, it it will not be possible if this yeah. If I was not there, no, absolutely. And and what you were doing while they were holding the fort was walking through the markets. And you know you're really interested in the history of of your home country. And you look at the trade routes and the mm-hmm. impact of the trade routes and that wonderful story that history can tell mm-hmm. through food. And it's about that human connection for you and your final food moment is the pumpkin flower quesadilla which you found in the markets tell us about that one well basically i think it's a really simple recipe like super extra simple but um is you have the corn in the tortilla then you have a really nice fresh cheese in in mexico usually the people use oaxaca and cheese and the pumpkin flower that is very popular in Mexico because uh, what Mexicans do from ancient time is to to cultivate corn, pumpkin, and beans. So it, I, I get impressed when I see here the price for pumpkin flower of like the, the cost is uh, one pound, and in Mexico it's like a bunch of like probably twenty thirty pumpkin flowers for yeah. two pounds <laughs> which is yeah, ridiculous absolutely but it does tell that story of the three sisters style of growing crops which goes right the way back to the beginning of cultivation uh, which is culture which is people and food together um the corn was used as a pole for the beans and courgettes then climb across the the ground preserving the humidity and keeping the weeds at bay and you talk about this as something that has still used um, as a central tenet of uh, growing culture in Mexico but also North America um, you know in Mexico you say it's called milpa um, meaning kitchen garden yeah. or, or the veg patch um, and from there the medicinal foods like potatoes chilies tomatoes and amaranth and that is basically all you need and that is it isn't it it's the sort of the simple nature of our relationship with the ground and the land and what yeah. we eat and that's the story that goes right the way through the book it's incredibly simple but turns into this beautiful set of dishes on the plate it's quite wonderful yeah thank you so much and uh, yeah i think that that connection with the earth i think is something that we have been missing a lot in big cities in big um you know like we go always like running running eating whatever we can and um through the years um i have been feeling this uh like need to connect connect more with with that you know with nature with the way how my grandpa, because my grandpa used to be a farmer and he has like these cornfields with, uh, um, I mean, uh, he had a lot of animals and stuff. So I think I miss that and also to share that with people, no? because it can be very simple, but we tend to forget to to say thank you to, to nature for that. And exactly, that's which is why. kind of where we lost our way. But you do say yeah. that you've made plans for your restaurant, Cavita, to work with the Wild Foundation to celebrate your your real interest in sustainability. And you're also working with a mental health charity, having been through such a tough time yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about working with both of those um, organisations. Yeah, for, with the mental health is uh, actually the brother of my business partner. He's uh, helping us to to try to bring this um, project to the restaurant because I think also like being in all these big restaurants that sometimes mental health um, is not really important and you just need to deliver and deliver and deliver, you know. Uh, I feel is really 
important, uh, not just for me, for everyone. And hopefully also that helps with the quality, you know, quality, not just in food and service, but also the quality of life of everyone that is working in, in this company. Um, and in in the other hand, the Boa Foundation, I always feel very connected to to indigenous communities in Mexico. And I start to travel now to the Amazon because I've, it's something that is it, calling me. <laughs> Uh, and I want to learn more, you know, from these 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 people. They are amazing. I mean, they they. I just went to the Amazon in March, and I found these these guys that are uh, teaching local communities to to live more sustainable. And they are planting a lot of trees in the Amazon, and they are doing this reforestation. And then I met this uh, owner, well, the the founder of Boa Foundation, and he works also with other communities in Mexico uh, that is called Wir the Wirarica, is one of the oldest uh, indigenous communities that still preserve uh, pilgrimage and offerings to the land. And um, I mean, they, they are f amazing also. So basically they have these two areas but also other communities around the world. So I was like, well, if I can do something to help them, why not through the restaurant also, you know, like, and put a little bit of help into the world somehow. <laughs> uh, so it's some well, another project that I want to do also here, uh, maybe make a big fundraise next year, or like, I'm trying to figure it out how, how I can put it more like, in, in a plan on a, a big a bigger scale yeah thanks for listening head over to my Substack, click on the link in my bio to hear more from adriana and all my guests in extra bites